Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and, and thank you all for coming. Uh, my talk today addresses racial injustice, which persists in our country, is structural in its influence, and seems to be intensifying. And I'd like to reflect on this perpetual disgrace in the context of our university, where particularly over the course of the past 40 years, we've aimed to tackle injustice in various ways. As for racial injustice, we can claim that members of this very audience have pioneered in our efforts, in many cases at personal cost, as the progress of racial equality whether here at Georgetown and certainly in the broader society, has moved at a painstakingly slow pace and involved multiple contractions. And I hope in this talk to encourage all of us to pick up the pace, to commit to a more energized effort to address what has been the besetting conflict, evil, of our American society, racial injustice. Now we at Georgetown have much to acknowledge, to celebrate over these past 40 years, acknowledging the excruciating slow pace and compromises involved. I'm taking the period from the mid-1970s to today as my context because these years represent a period of intentional focus for Georgetown. And many of those responsible for this progress are here today. Let us celebrate the people whom we see around us, who have helped us in understanding how difficult this effort of both integrating and promoting inclusion has been. In 1976, Father Timothy Healy came to Georgetown and it was during his years of leadership that Georgetown began a new arc of engagement. Sam Harvey joined our community in 1976 and served as director of our Center for Minority Student Affairs until he was named Georgetown's first African-American vice president in 1988. Gwen Michael also joined our community in 1976 and later became the first African-American to be tenured on the main campus. Rosemary Kilkenny joined our community in 1980 as a special assistant to the president for affirmative action programs and now serves as our first vice president for diversity. Every year, Rosemary produces our university's affirmative action plan for the Department of Labor. John Thompson, Jr arrived in 1972. His singular style of leadership for 27 seasons as head men's basketball coach is recognized by our community in our annual celebration of Martin Luther King Jr. Day with the John Thompson Jr. Legacy of a Dream Award. Our GEMS program at our medical school was established in 1976. Our community scholars program is now more than four decades old. We rededicated our Black House, founded in 1973 in a new and larger residence in 2013. And over the years, so many of you, Renee Devine, David Wilmot, Dennis Williams, Michael Smith, Monica Raskow, and Bill Reed, and Joe Neal, about Paul Cardacci and Jim Slevin, and later Tom Bullock and Charlene Brown McKenzie. There are so many others, all who have made extraordinary contributions to our efforts. And none of this would have been possible without the work of these special women and men who have enabled Georgetown to unlock a potential that lay unfulfilled through much of our history. At the same time as these preliminary efforts were underway, Georgetown undertook an expansion turn 
in our journey toward greater excellence. In the mid-1970s, we intentionally began moving from being a regional, undergraduate-centric institution to a national research university. In recent years, we have experienced stellar growth and development. In the first years of this century, we have raised more money than in all of the years prior, since 1789. Our endowment is now more than $1.5 billion. We've added $1.3 billion to our campus infrastructure, enhancing the homes for our business school, for the sciences, for the performing arts. We added our first new school in 60 years. And while we have fully navigated the transition from regional to national, we've embraced the challenge of what it means to be a truly global university. And we've done this while seeking to intensify our commitment to the deepest values that have animated our community since our founding, including a commitment to justice, to supporting a range of disciplines and areas of research, and our openness to a world of ideas. It is this understanding that we can never be static, that our journey of engaging primary issues of justice that characterizes the modern history of Georgetown demands ever more of us continually. What are the issues of injustice that are salient for us now that demand further engagement for Georgetown because they are so significant for our nation, for all of us? Well, not for the first time hardly, but in the last year and a half, we have been witness to incidents that shake our confidence in for many, an assumption that as a country, we were overcoming the legacies and their structural groundings of slavery, sub subsequent se segregation, and systemic racism in so much of our lives. Certainly the transparency that characterizes the technologies we use, the ubiquity of access to images through new forms of media, our connection to one another, have enabled a flow of ideas and perspectives at a speed without precedent in history. At the same time, the underlying structures of what leads to these depictions are and have been there for all to see. We just have better lenses today, and we're forced to see these structures squarely to acknowledge their existence. As such highly visible incidents from Sanford to Ferguson to Staten Island to Cleveland to Baltimore to Charleston to Chicago to Flint and so many more. These have shattered any hope that now in this, the eighth year of our first African-American president twice elected, we were somehow moving into a post-racial society. Along with our cameras, we have the realization that we are hardly post-racial. 150 years after the abolition of slavery, American society is still grappling with the problems of racism and racial injustice regarding our citizens of African descent. Recent public manifestations of racism and racial injustice have underscored the urgency of the need to address these problems. Persistent income, housing, education, and health disparities, as well as public demonstrations against police killings, escalating crime rates, increasing unemployment rates, mass incarceration of blacks through unjust sentencing practices, environmental discrimination. We are witnesses today of the ramifications of the American experience of racism traceable to the very settling of our country. What we witness must lead us to confront how continual racial injustice within the American context is manifest and how to identify creative responses to it. An authentic response from Georgetown recognizes our connection to this history, our effort to contribute as one of the world's leading universities, our Catholic and Jesuit heritage, and the resources 
of ecumenical and interfaith understanding. That some of these incidents occurred during the years in which we celebrated the 50th anniversaries of Dr. King's Nobel Prize, the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, that in 2016, before the Supreme Court, we have another case challenging affirmative action in higher education, only adds to the sense of how much work is still required to realize that abiding faith in America and audacious faith in the future of mankind that Dr. S Dr. King spoke of upon receiving his Nobel Prize. To be sure, the academy, our nation's colleges and universities, has addressed to one degree or another the persistent and enduring legacy of our past racial injustice, its history, and the structures that continue to underpin it. In a beautiful post on whose shoulders the research stands, following his Atlantic Monthly cover story, The Case for Reparations, Ta-Nehisi Coates wrote, this pace, this piece, this piece would not exist without the work of economists like Professor Darity, of historians like Barbara Fields and Tony Judd, of sociologists like William Massey and Devap Pager, of law professors like Kim Forde Masruri and Eric J. Miller, and so on. Without them, all my writing is significantly poorer. Without the academy, we are not talking right now. We are in possession of insights that should mobilize us to address this legacy. These insights not only point to but illuminate a set of deep structural issues that must be confronted if we are to realize the full promise of the American project. These insights in Mr. Coates' essay come from exceptional scholarship throughout the academy. As he recounts, Patrick Sharkey, sociologist at NYU, studied children born from 1955 through 1970 and found that 4% of whites, 62% of blacks across America had been raised in poor neighborhoods. A generation later, the same study show, showed virtually nothing had changed. The Harvard sociologist Robert J. Sampson examined incarceration, incarceration rates in Chicago in his 2012 book, Great American City. He found that a black neighborhood with one of the highest incarceration rates, West Garfield Park, had a rate more than 40 times as high as the white neighborhood with the highest rate. David Blight, Yale University. In 1860, slaves as an asset were worth more than all of America's manufacturing, all of the railroads, all of the productive capacity of the United States put together. Slaves were the single largest, by far, financial asset of property in the entire American economy. We can find other markers of structural impediments and the dreary statistics of inequality. Only 14% of African-American eighth graders score at or above proficient levels. Just over half of African-American African -American students graduate from high school compared to more than three quarters of white and Asian students. At the root of these inequities are structural disadvantages in school funding and in educational opportunity. We spend more than $80 billion on incarceration but whom do we incarcerate? The United States now accounts for less than 5% of the world's inhabitants and about 25% of its incarcerated inhabitants. And in 2000, one in 10 black males between the ages of 20 and 40 were incarcerated 10 times the rate of their white peers. People of color are significantly overrepresented in the US prison population, making up more than 60% of the people behind bars, despite being only 13% of the overall US population, 40% of those incarcerated are black. 
African Americans were enslaved for 250 years before emancipation. Post-emancipation did not bring equality. It brought Jim Crow. And while there have been important achievements over the past 150 years, we can't deny the continuing and persistent effects of the original fault line of this republic. For a place like Georgetown, it is of special importance for us to recognize this history, to recognize its implications for our nation and our responsibilities to one another. Our heritage as a Catholic and Jesuit university calls us to respond to the demands of social justice. As a Catholic university, we draw from the deep tradition of Catholic social thought. In modern times, this tradition has been captured in a series of 14 encyclicals, beginning in 1891 with Rerum Novarum of Pope Leo XIII, continuing to our present day with Laudato Si of Pope Francis. The development of this heritage has identified seven themes. Perhaps the most important is solidarity. And to quote from the US Catholic Conference of Bishops, we are one human family, whatever our national, racial, ethnic, economic, and ideological differences. And Pope Francis, speaking in Brazil in July 2013, never tire of working for a more just world marked by greater solidarity. No one can remain insensitive to the inequalities that persist in the world. Everybody according to his or her particular opportunities and responsibilities, should be able to make a personal contribution to putting an end to so many social injustices. As a Jesuit university, we have also embraced a challenge that was presented by the Superior General of the Society of, Je of Jesus, Father Pedro Arupe, throughout his tenure of leadership from 1966 to 1983. Father Arupe was acutely aware of the grave injustices in our world. Having been expelled by the Republican government in Spain, having lived in Hiroshima in 1945, painfully aware of the oppressive regimes in Latin America and the failure of some in the church to come to terms with those injustices. In 1973, Father Arupe laid the groundwork for a deeper challenge in a speech entitled, Men and Women for Others. He called on educators to undertake rigorous self-evaluation and quote, above all, make sure that in the future, the education imparted in Jesuit schools will be equal to the demands of justice in the world. We at Georgetown have been responding to Father Arupe's challenge for more than four decades. We have not, however, sufficiently grappled with the problem of racial injustice. And this is not just a Catholic and Jesuit issue. It is a crucial moral issue that is both ecumenical and interfaith that is strengthened by the cooperative engagement of the faith traditions which contribute so powerfully to the Georgetown experience. We can draw on this distinctive strength of Georgetown as we embrace this moment of opportunity for our community. So what can we do at Georgetown to contribute to the work of realizing Dr. King's abiding faith in America and audacious faith in the future of mankind? Our intentions and our actions must be animated by moral imagination. David Bromwich, in a beautiful essay on moral imagination, finds our understanding of moral imagination as beginning in Edmund Burke and his efforts to under, understand the responsibilities of the British nation at a time of empire. The fundamental question of our moral imagination is to understand our responsibilities to those who we regard as other, as different from ourselves. For Burke, the test of justice of a moral imagination turns out to be justice 
to a stranger. The question we must engage in our time is what is the test of justice of a moral imagination today when we realize that the stranger is in fact our neighbor? There is no more urgent question facing our world than the question of understanding this test of justice. What are our responsibilities to one another, especially those who may be other, other than ourselves in this moment of unprecedented diversity and connectedness, but especially when we realize that the other, again, is our neighbor, our fellow citizen, an individual. Amin Malouf shares with us the insight that the combination of elements which gives each of us our authenticity, quote, gives every individual richness and value and makes each human being unique and irreplaceable. There have been moments in history when creative individuals, creative communities have responded to the demands of their times and found new ways to engage the world. John Hope Franklin shaping a new history, Martin Luther King Jr. fusing a philosophy of nonviolence to the unfinished American project, Rosa Parks deciding to take a different seat. In each case, they understood the demands of their moment. This is another such moment for all of us, for Georgetown. When John Hope Franklin in 1958 provided a new framing of the history of our nation, he was exercising his moral imagination. Drew Faust captured the breadth of Professor, Professor Franklin's moral imagination in the example that he set for all of us in the academy in a recent reflection on the centenary of his birth. President Faust writes, but he knew that erasing the color line required far more than electing a black president. Until we had a new history, we could not build a different and better future. The fundamental requirement, what we, and now quoting Professor Fra Franklin, what we need to do as a nation and as individual members of society is to confront our past and see it for what it is. It is a past filled with some of the ugliest possible examples of racial brutality and degradation in human history. We need to recognize it for what it was and is and not explain it away, excuse it, or justify it. Having done that, we should then make a good faith effort to turn our history around. President Faust concludes, in other words, it is history that has the capacity to save us. And I think to history we can add literature, philosophy, theology, sociology, psychology, anthropology, economics, business, political science, public policy, law, the health sciences. We need to focus our imaginations within each of our disciplines and across our disciplines and direct them to our faith in the future of humankind, one predicated on equality and justice. We have seen the imaginations of scholars across the academy like Greg Grandin and Edward Baptist and Walter Johnson and Sven Beckert, Isabel Wilkerson and Brian Stevenson, poets and performers, Claudine Rankin, Natasha Trethewey, Anna DeVere Smith, public intellectuals like ta Coates, Melissa Harris Perry, and right here, our own Adam Rothman and Maurice Jackson, Michael Eric Dyson and Scott Taylor, Paul Butler, Marcia Chatelaine, Gwen Michael and Angie Mitchell and Robert Patterson and Soika Colbert and Terrence Johnson and David Thomas and Pat King and Lucille Adams Campbell Campbell and Cheryl Cashin and Peter Edelman, Don McHenry, all bring an imaginative force resonant with the spirit that Drew Faust associates with Professor Franklin. Just over a month ago, following the recommendation of our working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation, we had a special ceremony in which we removed the names from two of our buildings, renaming them 
Remembrance Hall, and Freedom Hall. At that, at that time, I shared these words. Over 170 years ago, people just like us lacked the moral imagination in their moment to recognize the responsibilities that we have to one another, to see the humanity and inherent dignity of all peoples. Their days are not unlike our days. Their moral failings are not unlike our own. What would a fully alive moral imagination enable us to see in the challenges and injustices that we are called to confront in this moment? This is the moment for us to find within each of ourselves and within our community the resources of our moral imaginations to determine how we can contribute to responding to this urgent moment in our nation. This is not a moment for us to say, we are an old and venerable institution. We've been at this for many years. What more can we contribute? This is a moment for us to say, Georgetown today is in a different place because Georgetown is in the world, which changes and challenges us. And Georgetown has always aimed to be engaged in the world. It is in this place because of all of you, on the shoulders on whom we stand today, we now expect even more of ourselves, more of this institution. We have a new contribution to make at an urgent inflection point in our country. This moment demands our engagement in fact. We live our lives here with a heritage on which we build, a heritage we owe to others, many of whom are here today. We would not be the place we are today if it had not been for their efforts, Sam and Gwen and Rosemary, Coach, Renee and Don, so many of you who are here right now. We honor their efforts by how we respond to the moral urgency of this moment. I have benefited greatly from my conversations with so many of you over so many years and in recent weeks with those who have played such an important role in building our program in African American studies, and especially Robert Patterson and Angie Mitchell, Maurice Jackson, Doug Reed, Maya Roth and Joe Murphy and Elisa Kars. These colleagues have consistently, throughout their years here, called us to find the very best in ourselves and have served so selflessly over so many years. We have all been the beneficiaries of the efforts of our working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation, and the students who have raised their voices to honor those whose role on our campus has been overlooked and unacknowledged the forced labor of enslaved persons. Led by Father David Collins, this group of some of our university's most distinguished faculty and committed students, staff, and alumni is helping us to know this history, to memorialize it, and to inspire us to a better understanding of our present. Our students have made extraordinary contributions to this work. Some who are here today have been a part of a set of recent efforts to foster a community that is ever more diverse and inclusive. Two years ago, a group of students organized through the Black House shared with me a set of recommendations to help improve the experiences of our students of color on campus. With their hard work and their leadership and their close collaboration with our faculty, we now have a two-course diversity requirement, which will be implemented in the fall for all incoming undergraduate students. Also emerging from this work is the Provost Committee for Diversity, a standing committee of student leaders that advise and contribute to projects related to diversity and inclusion with particular attention to the experiences of our students of color. This work that is being undertaken by our students is built on a long tradition of engagement and leadership on issues of social justice by generations of students and alumni. This past fall, in a first Black Alumni Summit led by Tammy Thompson and Eric Woods, and just two weeks ago, we celebrated our annual Patrick Healy Dinner, made possible th through the leadership of our African-American Alumni Board, its chair, an extraordinary alumnus, 
Tyree Jones, who's here today, and the selfless and dedicated efforts of Manon Butler, who's also here today. As a university, Georgetown acknowledges its constituents, its students, faculty, staff, alumni, and those who have ultimate fiduciary responsibility, our board of directors. We are also a Catholic and Jesuit institution, and we adhere to that identity intrinsic to us from our founding. We have pursued, given these varied constituencies, organic growth, participating, and change, emphasizing alignment among our multiple parts. This approach, which defines our work as a university community, should guide our efforts to take the steps I suggest are needed to respond to the demands of this moment, where we are squarely facing unresolved issues of structural injustice in our nation. Our efforts need to contribute to this moment in a way that is authentic to the work of the academy and will certainly require all of us to locate and to contribute the capabilities and capacities commensurate with the moral urgency we now face. This is work we will all do together. Based on, that, on this belief in our shared responsibilities and the conviction that Though our university is by no means as wealthy as many of our peers, we have our values, we have our community approach. And I suggest that we make, we make four commitments as we move forward in the pursuit of ameliorating the structural injustices that pervade our racial divides. I provide this framework with an understanding that the work I recommend will require the engagement of our community. Nothing I propose can occur without the appropriate participation of our faculties, our school executive committees, our consultative bodies, our formal governance structures. Where should this journey take us? Four new commitments. First, to celebrate this work, we at Georgetown need a center of gravity, a place where we can bring together Bring together colleagues, faculty, students, postdocs, public intellectuals, and more to ensure that we are contributing to the work of advancing the disciplines in the field of African American studies. Georgetown will build upon the recent decision of the Executive Committee of the college to establish a major in African American studies and will now seek to create a department and or a broader interdisciplinary program of African American studies. Departments provide homes for mentoring of faculty, for tenure, for majors and minors. They are our most common form of academic structure. The essential elements are a charter of some permanence, faculty citizenship that is long lasting, a size that permits diversity of intellectual approaches, and a space that is home. Across our nation's universities, a department of African American studies has been the most common approach of organization. At the same time, we recognize that to draw from the full resources of our community, it will be important to determine how best to capture the interdisciplinary character of this work. How can a department of African American studies support this inter interdisciplinary character? Given our location in Washington and the strengths of our existing schools, we need to ensure that any such unit will provide a home for the full range of disciplines that can contribute to building the field of African American studies. Indeed, we need every discipline that can contribute insights to the building of this field. Following our conversation today, I will work with Provost Groves in establishing a working group, a working group on racial injustice, a Georgetown response that will explore a range of questions, including whether the structure of a traditional department will support interdisciplinary work that crosses the full range of schools and disciplines that can contribute to this effort. Perhaps we need a department and an interdisciplinary program. 
These are important issues for us to consider as we move forward. A second step would amplify this center of gravity. We must establish a new research center that studies racial injustice and the persistence, persistent and enduring legacy of racism and segregation in America. We need to address the structural causes at the root of persistent inequalities, persistent racial injustice in American society. This would not be the first such research center in the academy, but again, an institution with our distinct set of characteristics must engage the continuing challenges that flow from the tragic history of slavery and segregation of our nation. Persistent differences in educational outcomes, health disparities, economic participation, the increasing inequalities across our nation all require a sustained and enduring commitment that only the academy can provide. Understanding and solving these issues cannot be achieved with one body of knowledge within one discipline. We need teams of researchers working to make progress and we need to tap all of the re relevant external funding institutions to make the research center sustainable. In Georgetown's way of life, faculty and students would be working side by side in these teams. At this moment, we should bring the resources of a new research center at Georgetown to bear on these matters. The research center will provide a new framework for integrating the resources of Georgetown in the service of justice. By doing so, we become congruent with Decree 4, which in 1974, in the 32nd General Congregation of the Jesuits, set forth a redefinition of the order. And we have been living with this redefinition here since 1974. And it reads, the mission of the Society of Jesus today is the service of faith of which the promotion of justice is an absolute requirement. I will look to this working group to be established shortly after this town hall to identify how best to realize this vision. There will be many important issues that must be confronted. The scope of such a research center, its relationship to our schools and departments. How would a new research center connect and complement other centers that already are at work here at the university doing crucially important work? How will it, how will it relate to a new department, a new interdisciplinary commitment to African American studies? Third, we can't accomplish either of these two goals without a critical mass of new, of new colleagues dedicated to this work. And we will commit to recruit the number of faculty commensurate with the commitments needed to support a department and or interdisciplinary center and a research center. As we expand the number of faculty recruited to support this work, we expect that some of, some of these faculty can contribute to the educational program some the research program, some to both. And in addition, will be strengthened through, the, through additional graduate fellowships and postdoctoral opportunities. As first steps for the coming year, we'll authorize four immediate recruitments of new members of the faculty and four recruitments for the following year. These will be new, new lines above and beyond what we would normally have been engaged in in our recruitment efforts over these next two years. And again, I will ask the working group to recommend areas of focus for faculty recruitment, working collaboratively with the deans, the department chairs, and our faculty colleagues. And finally, to support these efforts, we will need a new senior officer who will support the efforts of establishing a department, a dis interdisciplinary program, a research center, and supporting, especially supporting the recruitment of this cohort of faculty. Such an officer will bring a focus to faculty recruitment working collaboratively with our provost, our vice provosts, with our Office of Institutional Diversity, Equity, and Affirmative Action. We will work with our senior leadership from the main campus, from the Law Center, and the medical campus. Bill Trainer, Ed Healton, Bob Groves all share in their vision that this is a moment where we can significantly strengthen our community. Surely other elements 
besides these four will emerge. You may already have some ideas, just as I unfold mine. It is my intent that these four commitments provide the architecture for taking this next step for Georgetown and a working group will ensure that we engage this moment in a manner consistent with our shared style of governance. But let me be clear on one point. I commit Georgetown to making these important new investments. These will happen. But we will do this. We will, we will do this important, this, as we do all important and successful work that we have all been a part of here together by listening to one another, letting all who can contribute to participate in the new endeavors and working together to achieve our goals. These discussions will not be about whether we do these things, but how best to do them and the urgency of the moment. We will find the very best in each other and together we will find new ways to bring out the very best of Georgetown. So in closing, why is this a priority now? Because our social and political culture has not been remedied. And in fact, from a set of recent events, it has deteriorated. Because there is a holy impatience among the African American community that delay is just another way of saying no. Because the moral imperative for complete social justice continues to summon us, not to discussion, but to action. And that summons will not go away. We ignore social morality at our peril. And why us? Why this educational response? Well, I offer these reflections from three perspectives. As an educator, we live our lives here as a university. There is work that we do in our society that is distinctive. We, su we support the formation of young people, our students. The inquiry, the scholarship and research of our faculty. We contribute to the common good. And this commitment to our educational service to the common good demands that we use our rich resources and moral prestige to contribute to this same common good. I offer these reflections as a citizen with an obligation to seek and to implement actions for the common good of our country. And I offer these reflections in my role as the executive responsible for overseeing our mission. I must call us to honor our corporate commitment to the faith traditions, not only of our Catholic and Jesuit tradition, but to all the other faith communities who have a home in our community and call us to stand for justice. I am a product of this place. I offer these reflections as the beneficiary of the friendships that I have shared here over four decades. I hope some of you will recognize your influence on me in these words, I am grateful. And we now need to proceed as a community. And you all represent the very best humane implementation of this act of justice. So I'm presenting this charge that we do our part as an important educational community to hasten the common good and the shared justice for those for whom it has been too long denied. And I wish to thank you for your presence here today. And I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. And as you depart, we will share with you copies of the charge document that will guide our working group that will be established shortly after, after our conversation today charge to the working group will give you a sense of some of the specific, specific areas of focus that I would like us as a community to engage. And it's an invitation to all of you to be a part of this ongoing conversation.
So again, thank you for being here, and I'd be happy to take your questions on anything you'd like to discuss. Thank you very much. I think we've got microphones on the aisles, um, so be happy to uh, pass you the mics wherever you may be. Yeah. Hold on one second. Alan. Jack, thank you very much for those, those remarks and for the enthusiasm that you demonstrated uh, that really backs the, the image of Georgetown globally. You are clearly open to other suggestions, and you know we're working on some projects. Yes. Uh, when should we get those suggestions to you? <laughs> <laughs> so ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you know Alan Sessoms. He, he, he joined our community a little over a year ago, uh, formerly, formerly the president of the University of the District of Columbia. And clearly, Alan is far more um, patient and has uh, some great manners because, <laughs> because not very many people ask when to send me stuff. I get stuff all the time. Uh, but uh, what I would encourage anybody, if you have thoughts in regard to what you heard today, and as you reflect on it, we'll post both the remarks and the charge. The charge to the working group is about five pages long. You'll see the kinds of questions that we want to really engage. But you'll have some other ideas based on the work you're engaged in too. We want, it, we want those ideas. We want to see how we can, how we can take this moment. And in this, I, so the, the, there, there are some folks here, Alan, who've been a part of this for 40 years and even longer. And they have been living with some of these questions. This has been their life. As I, as I look out and I look at David Wilmot in the fourth row here, what year did you, what did, what year did you start as Dean of Admissions? 73. Dean of Admissions at Georgetown University Law Center. Um, when the history of, of that period of Georgetown, actually when the history of that period of America is written, what was done at Georgetown University Law Center uh, was extraordinary. That no other law school was able to do what we were able to do under, under David's, David's years of service as, as Dean of Admissions. And there's something, I believe, about this moment that enables us to build on everything that, and I could point out another dozen people right now, there's something about this moment. We, we couldn't have had this conversation even a decade ago. We were still struggling with all kinds of, we didn't have the kind of confidence in our ability to take on this, this kind of, of challenge. But as I tried to re reflect, we, we, we as a community are doing some really, really important, we're doing some of the best work in our history right now. And I believe that that capacity gives us a, a chance now to say to ourselves, how can we move forward in ways that we couldn't have imagined? And that's really that call to our moral imaginations. We don't need to, to look back and say, why didn't we do this sooner? I don't think we could have done some of this sooner but we can do it now, and this is our moment, and it's for all of us to seize this moment and to, to do everything we can to realize it. Yes. Oh my goodness. Microphone down here right away. <laughs> Sam Harvey, but people need to hear you, so, so hold, hold on. People in the back need to hear you. Thank you so very much for your message. It's, it's, it's heartfelt and I very much appreciate it but it scares me a little bit. And what scares me is that it sounds a little bit valedictory. A little? Valedictorially, you know what I think? Um, Are you planning <laughs> anything? You can't do this job unless you've got that kind of sense that 
we are going to do this. Yeah. But, but of you, all the people in this room, you are entitled to have some skepticism. So No, no. <laughs> I'm not skeptical about what you want to do or that you're serious about doing it. What, I'm, what, what scares me is, are you planning to be a part of it oh, for yeah. some time to come? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I think my wife thanks you. <laughs> Uh, this is, this is, so I, 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 I joke about this from time to time. Th th these are um, s sort of challenging positions. Um, but this is what I do. And um, when I'm asked, you know, just how long will you keep doing this? I serve at the will of the board of directors. And as long as it makes sense, I'll keep, keep trying to do the very best I can. And when it doesn't make sense, I hope I'm the first one to realize it <laughs> and, and make that judgment then. But Sam, I think what I recognize here is there are a set of commitments I've made to the institution right now in terms of trying to realize certain things. And, and this is added to it in the sense that I feel a personal sense of responsibility to get a trajectory here to ensure that when, when at another time in history later, when people look back, they're going to say about us, about this community, when they had their moment, they did, they did the best work they were capable of doing. And I just want to make sure I can do my part to support all that. But thank you. It's kind of you to ask. David Wilmot. I had to ask the year you started, David, because I came a little later, and, but I've only known you in that context. So. Um, well, first, good evening to everyone, or good afternoon, more importantly. Um, I have three um, uh, comments from, from my perspective. Um, uh, I started at a place called the University of Arkansas in the early 60s, and uh, when I showed up there, um, I didn't realize that there were only two of us that were going to be in the entering class two African Americans. Um, I'm, I'm reminded, and I recently spoke at the university because of some honor that was given to us. That's what they do now is they give, give us honors as opposed to making uh, sustainable changes, and that's why I'm... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that's why I'm commending your leadership um, because um, I was relegated. Could you imagine any of you here, um, that we have this beautiful dorm on this beautiful campus, and Joe Nunn and I were relegated to a wing so as not to integrate the dorm. Um, I say that in the context of this. Um, I had a guardian angel when I arrived at Georgetown, and you know who that is, and so we really have to pay uh, some thanks and respect to him because he's looking down on us and saying that he's trained us well, and that's Timothy S. We can't do what we're doing because I would say to you, all the times that we were trying to move in the direction that we needed to move, there was so much criticism within the academy. I heard remarks that there are too many blacks in the class. I heard remarks that they don't belong here. I heard remarks that we were engaged in an experiment. Uh, but Tim Healy stood fast and he says many times, you just keep doing what you're doing. But he was one of my greatest recruiter because he said to me, what you are doing, uh, Dean Wilmot, is that you're identifying all of the privileged and empowered black folks. And he would find in an airport someplace someone and he'd say, this person is truly disadvantaged. And he'd direct him to us. These people are now practicing law. One of the things that he did, and I don't know if you knew this, Jack, but he gave up a significant portion of his salary to us to provide scholarships. Uh, that was part of the leadership. Um, so it's going to take a lot of courage because we're really talking about 400 years of injustice. I mean, it's not talking about injustice the last 20 years or so. And it's going to take the resolve of everyone in this room and beyond in order to start addressing it in a real way. Because as I stand here right now, at this very minute, 10 minutes from the White House, we have African-American kids who are homeless, who are hungry. 
we have unwanted pregnancies. We have a significant number of people who are on a path to jail. Uh, we have programs that we need to attack. S social promotion doesn't work for us as African Americans. And if we can do anything, we need to attack that. You know what social promotion really means? It means that if you don't meet the requirements to move from the first grade to the second grade, you're skipped. When you get to the ninth grade, you don't have skills for the third grade. And that's when you really have to pass. So nobody wants to be 17 years old in the ninth grade. So the challenge is great beyond this institution. As you know, Father Healy enable us to not just be in the community, but to be of the community. And I suggest to those of you who are going to take on this charge that we really have to be of the community as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, thank you so much for this. Um, I'm moved today. This is the best of Georgetown. This is part of why I have been proud to be part of this university for 25 years. Um, it's in no way meant as uh, a criticism or stepping back from that to say I hope we all also recognize the leadership role of students in all of this. Uh, students of color who pushed and encouraged and collaborated and in a lot of cases put themselves on the line and took risks to bring us to the moment we're at today and I think it's enormously important that that always be remembered. Uh, secondly, in terms of a sort of suggestion or input, the other thing that's brought us here today is the movement happening in the world on the streets of Ferguson and Chicago and Detroit. You mentioned it in your remarks. Um, I think we all know that that's part of what's created the possibility for these kind of uh, initiatives at institutions. And so in thinking through, you mentioned several times the need for the whole community to be involved. As a university that believes in community-based research, community-based education, I hope that that leadership will be part of the discussion too, that we will bring in the kind of people who are mobilizing communities that are on the front lines of the problems you're talking about, and that we not see the community simply as, you know, us academic people. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you again so much. Thank you very much, Mark. Hi, how are you? Georgetown, and now I work with the, oh sorry, Georgetown Scholarship Program. Yes. And so my question for you is, you mentioned quite a bit of things that you're trying to do to attract more faculty of color. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what sort of commitments can be made to attract more students of color to this campus for them to apply. Sure. Well, Thanks. certainly, of course, the program that you're a part of, um, the program that you're a part of is one of, the, one of the framing elements that has enabled us to strengthen our overall approach. The, fu the, the fundamental first step always is to ensure that we can sustain our commitment to need-blind admissions and to meeting full need. The meeting full need is the most significant way in which we are able to ensure the kind of, the kind of student body that we aspire to. The, the, there's another element beyond the infrastructure, and that infrastructure includes far, far more than the Georgetown Scholarship Program. It goes all the way back more than f four decades. I've made reference to the Community Scholars Program. Our, offer, our office now of the Center for Minority Educational Affairs, those pieces are all very important. Also, our outreach. We have established some rather unique partnerships with, with some institutions that are serving, serving students that most, most likely wouldn't find their way here through the normal kinds of channels. The most, the most um, significant that I could point to is one that goes back 25 years which we do in East Los Angeles. Another one is um, our, our relationship to the Cristo Ray schools. We have, a, we have a large set of ties to this new set of, of institutions um, that have grown over the course of just about 20 years. The first one opened in Chicago in 1996. We've had more than 50 young students, young, young graduates of Georgetown come out of Cristo Ray High Schools to come here and we have not missed a single student who has joined us from a Crystal Ray High School. And we have about 35 here right now from, from the 25 high schools from around the country. 
those are, those are the elements, the architecture of which you are a part, the need-based full financial aid program, which is the most significant piece that we have in place, and then the, the relationships that we have to communities and to schools that have helped to provide uh, a feeder network for us. Thank you. Hello? Yes. Yeah. How you doing, President? Uh, great speech. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think a lot of people are a little happy right now. Um, me too. So I had a question. So it's, it seems like we're going to tackle equity on this campus. And I really want to know what was the role of the center? <clears throat> Excuse me. What was the, what's going to be the role of the center in encouraging, not encouraging, encouraging students to continue their education here and supporting them on their front lines as they make that sure. transition sure. to a place like Georgetown? And what was the role of this center and other, other peer institutions, yeah. as well as how will it work in tandem with equity? And sure, that's sure. the CMEA here sure. on campus. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, couple key points that I just want to make sure inf inform the way we think about this. Um, first, uh, we don't start from scratch. Uh, we have some exceptional or, uh, parts of our organization, elements, structures that currently are engaged in very important work. Our, our program in, in African American Studies, if it didn't exist, we would have a challenge to be able to make a commitment to a department. The work that goes on in centers like Peter's at the Law Center, Peter Edelman, who's, who's right, right over here, has been at the forefront of addressing issues of poverty from, well, I, I don't, do, you want, do I want to age you? I mean, this, he, he goes back longer than David Wilmot, so, uh, but, but Peter's, Peter's Center on, on, at our Law Center has, has been very, very s central. I mean, it's worth taking a look at some of the work they've been engaged in over the course of a generation to see how the academy can really contribute in meaningful ways to addressing the challenges that we now want to confront. I don't want to say for a moment that we don't have some great work that we will be building from. But what I guess I would say is there are a number of other things that are moving right now. Our status, our stature as an institution, the, the capacities that we have by virtue of the talent that is now here, the, um, the expectations that we have of ourselves today. It, it, for, for those who've been here for, for more than a generation, we just expect more of ourselves today. And, and it's one thing to expect it, but we believe a combination of factors enable us now to realize that, that expectation. We will not be successful unless we and are, are able to provide real contributions to this work. Three, the city that we're a part of, it's ever evolving. In the, in the last year, Maurice Jackson of our history department, he actually was for a couple of years, he was asked to do this by, by Mayor Gray and he worked with a group of colleagues that Ed Montgomery and our, and our McCourt School of Public Policy was able to assemble to support him in looking at the, at the evolving context for African Americans in the city of Washington. And Maurice and some of our, our graduate students in public policy pulled together some very important reports for the city. Uh, on the city is changing, the opportunities, the resources of the city. We will open a new piece of the Smithsonian this September when you think about where we are as an institution, how the city's changing, what we have to build from, the expectations we have of ourselves, and, and some of the successes that we've had in recent years, this is a moment for us to do something ever, ever more, ever deeper, ever stronger. And the key thing is, we are a university. So whatever we do, it is what universities do. So this will be an academic research center but it's the research that will take place in that center that just might be able to enable us to make our contribution to addressing this moment. If for us, we have to find a way in this moment to make the best contribution we possibly can. And that's what we're gonna to try to do in the center. Right in the back, up, up top. 
all I can see are, it, the, the, the lights are a little black. I would call your name, but I can't see the, through the lights. Please introduce yourself. Hi, President DeJoya. My name is Yerlin. I'm actually a senior um, women's and gender studies major. <laughs> Hi, Andrea. <laughs> um, I was wondering how this new center will affect our Latino studies program and our African studies program since they're currently one and they're very different. That's, that's going to be work we have to engage in together. And I couldn't, I could not give you an answer to that. All I can say is the charge to the working group will be such that the questions that will require our engagement are the ones that we will have to confront. And that will, that will be one of them. There will be others that I will learn of shortly after we finish this conversation. <laughs> and while I may not have them all on the list right now, know the list will continue to grow. But thank you for asking that question and know that it will be part of what we do. Scott Taylor. We have one back here first. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> it's okay. Aaron Metters here. Uh, just wanted to say, coincidentally, I ended up sitting next to the lady who started the African American Studies program at Georgetown, Dr. Angela Mitchell, who happened to be my English advisor, so I'm definitely putting her on the spot. I think she deserves a round of applause. So I was able to pick up the minor in uh, my final year at Georgetown, uh, it came online my second semester, junior year, 2004. I'm Catholic, but right now for me this feels like the traditional black church religious experience. I've been like a kid in a candy shop, tweeting, Facebooking, all the things. Um, and so. In addition to saying thank you, President DeJoya, and everybody here from the university community, uh, I, you may know I am the chair of the Communications and Engagement Committee for the GUAAB, and my question is, what are the thoughts on how we're going to be able to help share, you know, to use another religious reference, the good news here, how are we going to be able to tell people who went to Georgetown, who are interested in Georgetown, what the next steps are? I presume that the speech and the transcript will be on the site, uh, but any kind of thing that you need, is there a game plan for that? That's my question. No. Um, all, every, every ounce of energy I've had has been to get me to this moment. <laughs> but Aaron, Aaron, not everybody would know what the acronym means. The Georgetown University African American Board, Alumni Board, which Aaron is the communications chair. Tyree Jones is, is sitting right here. Um, Stacy Kerr, who handles our public affairs, and Eric Smulsa. We've got a wonderful group of colleagues who can work that question very, very well. So I, I am sure we'll come out of this with a way of trying to share this in, in the most uh, powerful way we can with our, with, with our larger community. Uh, Scott Taylor and then Tyree. Um, Chuck, thank you very much for your comments here today and for your leadership. Um, I, I, I was very inspired by what you had to say. Um, and I want to echo the comments of this is the best of Georgetown. Uh, and it's uh, a moment of pride for me to be part of this community. I want to know, um, in a way, to maybe continue the church uh, analogy. <laughs> I mean, you're, you are, I suspect, largely preaching to the converted in this room. Um, and I want to know what actions you and the various committees plan to take or um, will take when you encounter pockets of resistance mm -hmm. around Georgetown. Um, I, you know, I, I noticed that you said that one of the constituencies, and indeed a, a very important one, will be the faculty. Um, I suspect that among at least some of my colleagues there will be some either active resistance or disengagement. This is not important to, to me, to our research, to what we do. Um, how, do how do you and we as part of this group uh, try, what are the ways in which we can counter that, uh, the resistance that we are, will inevitably face in this effort? Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Um, let me try to give maybe three ways of responding. One is um, what, what I hope I tried to get at in, in the remarks. And this is a different moment. And 
you may think you have a grasp of what, what is at stake right now, I want to make sure we as a community understand the seriousness of, of what we're trying to respond to, what we're trying to address. And what I hope we can do through lots of different things that we do as a community is to continue to, to keep this focus on this moment. So for example, I think I've shared in other occasions, we've launched a new series that we've asked a very distinguished uh, journalist, Michelle Martin, to help, help support for us, facilitate for us. And I think you'll see some, some experiences in the coming weeks that um, will, will provide lots of opportunity for us to really go at the issues that are at stake here. If you disagree with something that I have to say today, we'll, we'll create contexts where we can, we can work, work these issues. I think second, um, one, one advantage that I've had by virtue of the, the, the arc of my own personal history here is um, I get to work with people, I've been able to work with people at very different times in their lives. And I know that for some, by virtue of the work that they're engaged in right now, their scholarship, the, 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 the work they may be engaged in in a laboratory or in a carol, it may be um, having a disproportionate impact on their life. They're finding it hard to meet other obligations, whether it be in the classroom or with their families or as citizens. I, I believe a university community has to respect that because we, we, that's what we do here is provide room for people to try to work through those moments. This, is, this should be a safe and secure place for somebody to see a project through over a long period of time. And if, if right now in their life they're not able to grasp the significance of, of what we're engaged in in, in this conversation, I, I want to I respect that. But I also want to ensure that we're unrelenting in our care and attention to these issues so that when they are ready, when they are capable, when, when, when they've finished a project or they're, they're really ready to move on, they may came, come back and say, wow, I, I didn't realize all that was happening here at that time because for very good reasons, they're otherwise focused on something else. But as a community, our job is to try to ensure that we sustain that continuity of, of focus and attention so that when, whenever it's the right time for somebody, we are ready for them to engage those questions. I think, I think let, let me stop at that and I think, I hope, and I hope what you'll see is some, some actions that will be the fact behind, behind this call today. Tyree? Thank you, Jack. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Tyree Jones. I'm the chairman of the <clears throat> African American Alumni Advisory Board. And I, one, want to thank you for your leadership today uh, and the passion that you delivered those remarks. Um, if that didn't resonate with everyone um, beyond the words themselves, then nothing will. Um, what I also want to do is make sure, and I know you know this, but to pledge it publicly so that the students here, that we alumni, we see you. We we watched them, we watched what was going on with regard to the movement to change the name on the buildings. And while we don't often get back to the main campus, or for that matter, back to the Law Center, <clears throat> where I'm an alumnus, and quite frankly, a result of the impact of Dean Wilmot's uh, work uh, in the 80s, and the Law Center now being led by Dean Trainer, um, we see you students, we are here for you as a resource. Even if you don't see us here on campus, please understand we are resource. The last point or question I'd have for you is I remember quite a while ago when I was a student, um, when we would hear presentations such like as this from our university president, um, we'd maybe leave and go back to our daily lives and our homework and everything else that's motivating us and wonder, well, that was really great, not really sure what that means for me to do. But can you speak a bit to the students and to us about what your vision is and the community is as to how students 
continue to do what they do on their daily basis, but continue to engage in this effort and, and how we as the alumni and members of the community can help them in that effort. Sure, sure, Tyree. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, in some respects, I, I would answer the question in a way that's a bit bit like I, I just answered Scott's question. And what I mean by that is what we provide is a community. And that community is increasingly a residential one. One more residents all going up. Uh, it's increasingly a residential one. But it is um, an extraordinarily gifted group of young people. These are among the most extraordinary young people in the world. And they come from from throughout the world. And they are, our job here, our role in their lives is to provide a context for their personal formation, the formation of themselves as authentic human beings who are capable of, of flourishing by the choices that they make and how to live their life. And what we do is bring them all here together we, we, we organize around knowledge. So you can engage in formation in lots of other settings. You can go into the military or a religious order or an entrepreneurial venture. Here, we believe that formation best occurs organized around knowledge, seeking it, understanding the methodologies, the approaches, and doing so surrounded by extraordinarily talented other young people and guided by an exceptionally gifted faculty. And our faculty's first, first role here is to help guide this work of formation. And again, a, a young person arrives here um, at 18, 17, 18, and if, if we are providing the context, the community for this work to take place, they're going to be exposed to a lot of ideas and a lot of challenges. And they are going to be made very uncomfortable on certain days. They'll be reassured on other days. They'll be nurtured on other days. They'll be challenged on other days. Providing that full range of experiences so that they can work through those questions. What do I want to stand for in my life? What are my responsibilities to my family, to my community, my church, my mosque, my synagogue, my country? How do I want to have the pieces of my, of my humanity connect? How do I want those pieces to, to fuse together in a way that I am the person that I am called to be? And what we want to ensure is that we're providing the experiences for that full range of, of questions that they will bring here. Now, two rows behind you is a woman responsible for a set of those questions. And that's Andrea, who runs our Center for Social Justice. And, <laughs> and it's one place where a set of questions are, are presented, whether it's in a van on the way down, down to the city to engage in a, a literacy project, or whether it's I don't even want to know sometimes. <laughs> is, it on the, you know, is it on the border in, in, of Mexico and Arizona where Father Kevin O'Brien brings a group of students for, over spring break? Imam Hendy has brought students together into a rural community in West Virginia. Uh, there's lots of different ways in which we do this. The Black House is a, an incredible resource for this community. The students who are resident there provide continual opportunity for engaging these kinds of questions. And, and if you look across the place, in the classroom, in the libraries, in our laboratories, on our fields, in, on our tracks, in our pool, in, in Lowinger, in, in Midnight Mug, in all of these places, if we're doing our work right, our students are being confronted with the, just those questions. And what we want to do is be ready when they're ready. That, that's the connection to Scott's, to Scott's question. When it's your moment to really engage these kinds of questions, when you have the confidence, the self-confidence, or the courage, or the, 
passion, whatever it takes for you to be able to break through and ask some of the tougher kinds of questions about intimate, interpersonal relationships with folks who may be different than yourself, we want to be ready here. And we just need to keep getting better and better and better at being ready. Okay. Yeah, right here. Hold it, it's coming right behind you. They want to get this for the tape. Hi, uh, Bonnie Morris, uh, Department, uh, excuse me, Program of Women's and Gender Studies, which I think is a natural alliance, uh, and I just like to put that out there. I'm totally committed to my participation Thank in the spirit of intersectionality. Um, I'd like to say, after teaching athletics and gender here for 20 years, I encounter many students who arrive here as veterans of activism, already leaders in activism. And it's my hope that a research center would not separate uh, academic research and writing from legacies of activism and make a space to welcome, immediately after their arrival, the students who come here who are leaders in activism yet intimidated by the prospect of academic writing. Um, I say this because I would hope that a research center would produce a journal and I think that's probably occurred to a lot of people here. But hopefully also make room for the students who shine in terms of performance culture and spoken word and who thereby uh, wouldn't be distanced as they move on the path to becoming research writers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, President DeJoya. Uh, my name is Pamela. I'm an undergrad. Um, so, first of all, I really, really, really liked your speech. Um, I like am pretty happy echoing some of the statements or sentiments in the room. Um, but I'm also nervous and I'm scared because being a student activist of color takes a lot of emotional energy that I don't always have to give. And so when students come up to me after class because I said something radical of critical theory and they want to know more about what I said because they are an IPEC major and they've never heard of my perspective before, um, <laughs> I get nervous because I think, oh man, um, what if you don't think my perspective, my reality is valid? So when you talk about you mentioned something about um, a core diversity requirement. Yes. Um, I'm not sure what you meant. I, I don't know if it's elaborated on in the... Um... No, no. Okay. Th this was actually approved last spring by our, by our executive faculty of our main campus, which came as the result of a, a great deal of work involving some of your colleagues and some of our faculty trying to strengthen our overall curriculum. Yeah, because uh, I would really like it. Um, I, I know that you can only take the horse to the water and you can't make him drink kind of thing, but you know, like if, if there was this perspective offered to students going into economics and going into business and going into, no, into, into health and nursing and so forth, because these are, many of the students who graduate from Georgetown SFS are the, the diplomats of the US in the future. And I think it's really important that they are exposed to these ideas, not from you know a horizontal perspective, but from a perspective that they respect a lot, which is that of their professors. So, and to foster a space in the classroom where um, students who are interested in social justice, you know, don't have to feel palms sweating and such for raising their hand and saying, sure well, have you ever considered this? And without being attacked, because as a student, a lot of our time is spent in the classroom. Um, well, not a lot of it, but you know, uh, <laughs> a fair amount of it is spent in the classroom. And it's good to have safe spaces, um, honestly, where we can speak up and, and learn from each other um, without feeling like, oh man, uh, someone's gonna come up to me after class or I'm gonna have a reputation or, you know. Sure, thank you very much. I think there's an important thing. Um, there, there's an important um, uh, uh, opportunity for discovery following this conversation. Our provost 
uh, Bob Groves and the Provost Committee on Diversity have been working very, care very carefully with a number of colleagues, including our Vice Provosts and our Deans, to implement this new um, uh, diversity re uh, requirement. And I think you're going to um, be pleased with what's unfolding, and I think it'll, it'll be a, an, in, an enjoyable experience to see what, what's going to emerge. This will all become live in September. Other questions? Yes. Hello. Hi. This is Queen. I'm a senior here, American Studies major. Um, I really appreciated your speech, and we've been focusing on like advancements for research and um, academic stuff, but I still have the Georgetown Voice article about workers on campus and how they were treated over break, over the snowstorm on, in my mind. And I've been wondering how you would work and improve the conditions that workers on campus are in. And I think that's like a racial and socioeconomic issue as well. I appreciate, I appreciate you bringing that, that up. The, um, the, the approach that we've tried to take over the last oh, more than decade uh, comes under the framework of what we call our just wage, um, which is a, an overarching framework that um, was intended to follow um, the approach of some of our local municipalities where we establish our wages well above um, the minimum wage. It's, in our case, I think we're in near, near $18 an hour for many of the workforce. Um, and the, the point I would simply make about the just wage framework, which has been guiding us, it's intended to try to ensure that we are living these values and these commitments that I'm referring to in this talk every day here and the way in which we engage our workforce. If we failed to do that over the, during the snow, snow break, we, we will we'll, we'll dig in, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, we, we, we will dig into that and, and determine where we missed it. But that, that is not the, the framework that we've put in place to guide this institution. The framework we have in place is driven by the same set of values that guided my talk today. And we'll just have to, have to get on on that and see where we may have missed. We have one, one more right here. Please. Hi, my name is Robert Lyons and I work in the Asian Studies program in SFS. Um, I just want to thank you for your leadership um, today and all your initiatives. Um, I'm reminded of so many resources and opportunities here in this room, the different centers and departments and faculty members who have given so much of their time and dedication in their career to um, fighting against injustice, racism, and so many other um, terrible legacies that are part of this country for 400 years. And as a staff member, um, I'm inspired and I want to do more to help and if there are ways for staff and AAP members to help with these initiatives, um, please let us know. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I, I mentioned a few times in the talk that um, uh, Bob and I will be uh, moving to put in place a working group that will work on these, on, on these issues. Um, I think I have a couple slides real quick. We're going to charge the working group with three tasks. The fourth, the new officer, Bob and Bill Trainer and Ed Healton and Rosemary, together they're going to work to, to, to determine the most appropriate way to move forward with establishing the new university officer who will support us in, in strengthening our ability in faculty recruitment. Um, but the three key tasks that we'll ask of the working group will be one to focus on, on African American studies. And as I, as I try to get at, a department and or an interdisciplinary center, we're going to just engage that work. Second will be the center that will enable us to go at this work of addressing structural injustice. And then, then third, the, the resources necessary to deliver those first two. And I mentioned the commitment to move forward. With new positions for faculty, we'll start, we'll start with this next cycle, we'll follow with another in the following year, and then we'll be informed by what unfolds over the course of these, these next weeks and months as we engage in the work of, 
of, of, of the working group and bringing this whole community together into a conversation about how, how best to realize our promise. Thank you all for being here today. I really, really appreciate it.